Hello and welcome back to Weird on the Rocks. This is a podcast that explores the weird, unusual, strange, and unexplained, all while getting our drink on. I'm your host, Katie. In today's episode, I'm going to be discussing a case that is so fascinating to me, which is the disappearance of Chris Kramers and Lisanne Froon, which is commonly referred to as the Lost Girls of Panama. I heard about this for the first time a few years ago on another podcast. I can't remember which one, but it really stuck with me. And when I decided to start my own podcast and I began making a list of topics, this was one of the first ones I put down. It's taken me a while to get to it because there is a lot of information out there and a lot of it is contradictory or in different languages. So this one definitely took a lot of time and energy for me to research. I hope I was able to get all the important information into it so that you guys can construct your own opinions on what you think happened. Before we get going today, I want to start a new segment on the show where I share another podcast that I think you guys might like. I'm still learning with all this podcast stuff and apparently people make trailers or promos for their shows that they can cross promote on other shows. So I made my trailer this weekend that I can send to other podcasts and I'm going to share some of my favorites on here for you guys. This is honestly the best way for other small indie shows like me to grow. So I hope that you guys don't mind that I'm going to incorporate this. The first show I want to share is that of my friend Sandy over at the Meet My Ghost podcast. Sandy and I started our shows around the same time, and we kind of became podcast friends and have supported each other. She does a solo show where she shares real life ghost stories very similar to my small town spooky episodes that I do. So if you're a fan of my show, chances are you're really going to love Meet My Ghost too. Welcome to Meet My Ghost, a podcast of short ghost stories where you'll hear a collection of quick but spooky encounters in each show. I'm Sandy Tufts, a therapist who's obsessed with all things haunted, and I'll bring you eerie tales, mostly true, some fiction, because there's nothing like a good ghost story. Simple, old school storytelling. Turn off the lights and listen up. Do you believe in ghosts? Join me for the show and you decide. You can find Meet My Ghost wherever you listen to your podcasts, as well as all social media, and visit meetmyghost.com. Come get creeped out with me. Thank you, Sandy, for sending that over, and you guys absolutely need to listen to her show. It is one of my regular podcasts I listen to. It's one of my favorites. It is so spooky and so entertaining. And as always, you can find my show on Instagram and Facebook at Weird on the Rocks Podcast and the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com, and I also have a Twitter now. We'll see how that goes. It's like a whole other world over there. Um, But I am at weird underscore rocks. If you do the Twitter thing, please rate and review the show and subscribe wherever you're listening now. Before we get into the good stuff today, I want to share this week's beverage of choice. Tonight, I am drinking a nice cold glass of Sauvignon Blanc. I am obsessed with white wine, especially during the warmer months. It is my favorite after work drink. It's just so crisp and refreshing. And tonight, I am drinking the Cupcake brand, and it is divine. I have definitely been known to polish off a whole bottle of this by myself. (laughs) All right, cheers, and let's get weird. Lisanne Froon, age 22, and Chris Kremers, age 21, were both born and raised in the town of Amserfort, Netherlands. In 2014, both women graduated from college, Lisanne with a degree in applied sciences and Chris with a degree in art education. After graduating, the two friends both began working at a local cafe, moved in together, and began saving money for a big trip. 
As a way to gain volunteer experience and work on their Spanish, the two lifelong friends decided to visit the country of Panama, located in Central America. Their plan for this trip was to stay with a local family, help volunteer in the small community, and also teach at a local school. Lasan and Chris arrived in Panama on March 15, 2014, and used their first two days as a vacation, traveling around the country and sightseeing. On March 29th, they arrived in the small town of Boquete, a rural mountain town, and settled in with their host family. The next morning, they arrived at the local school called Spanish by the River to check in with the program and begin their teaching, but they were told by the program's assistant director that they were a week early and could not begin working until the following week. Chris, in particular, was upset about the misunderstanding. In her diary, she wrote that the director was very rude and that she was frustrated that a trip that was so well planned could get messed up. However, the girls decided to make the most of their extra week and were interested in hiking around the area. They used Facebook to keep in touch with their families back in the Netherlands and posted that they were looking forward to walking around their town of Boquete. On March 30th, the girls hired a hiking guide to take them on the Pianista Trail that followed the Continental Divide. The guide they hired was a local man who told the girls they would hike to his privately owned ranch and they could stay the night out there with him. The Pianista Trail is 2.6 miles long and is about 2,000 feet in elevation. It takes you up a winding trail through the cloud forest with a summit at the top that overlooks the entire region and is known as the best lookout in all of Panama. For most healthy individuals from start to finish, the trail takes between three to five hours to complete. The trail does not loop, but instead is designed to reach the summit and return back down on the same trail. If you keep going and do not turn back around, a different trail, no longer considered the Pianista Trail, takes you deeper into the tropical forest. On the morning of April 1st, several local people claim to have seen the two girls having breakfast with two Dutch-looking men at a small cafe, although this detail could never be confirmed. Later, for reasons unknown, the girls decided to forego using the hiking guide they had hired for the next day, and they went off on the trail alone. Some think they were just excited to go and didn't want to wait until the next day, and some speculate that the girls just wanted to check out the trail and hike a little bit to get a sense of what the terrain would be like. The girls were both dressed in shorts, tank tops, and hiking boots. They packed lightly for their short trip, bringing with them a backpack. They took their host family's dog, a husky mix named Blue, along with them and took a taxi two and a half miles to the start of the Pianista Trail. Witnesses claim to have seen the two girls on the trail around 10 a.m., but little did they know they would be the last people to ever see Chris and Lisanne alive. Later on the evening of April 1st, the host family's dog, Blue, returned to the host family's home without the two girls, which concerned their host family, but they didn't think too much of it at first. The guide the girls hired was also concerned the next day when they did not show up for their guided hike, and he supposedly went to the host family's home. Nobody was home at the time, and he let himself in and looked around the room the girls were sharing and realized they had not been there recently. The guide then talked to the host family and encouraged them to contact the police. At first, the police did not think it was a serious situation and believed that the girls were out partying somewhere and would eventually return. Finally, after the girls had been missing for two full days, they decided to begin searching. This began with an aerial search of the Pianista Trail and surrounding areas. Chris and Lisanne's families back in the Netherlands were notified and, of course, they were shocked and concerned. Both families had kept in close contact with their daughters and both said that their communications with them had stopped around the same time, but they thought they were just out enjoying themselves. Both families described their daughters as very responsible and that not communicating with them was very out of character for them both. Their families flew in from the Netherlands and together with local community members, including the very tour guide they had hired, and local police and expert hikers familiar with the area, they began searching. Chris and Lisanne's families also offered a $30,000 reward for any information. On April 6th, five days after the girls were last seen, Cineproc, which is Panama's National Protection Agency, came in and asked the local police and community members to halt their searches and officially took over. Apparently, the searches were very disorganized, and local guide John Torblum was quoted as saying it was a complete clusterfuck, 
and that he and other local guides knew the area better than any of the higher-up officials. The search continued and was eventually called off after 10 days. Nothing was found. But 10 weeks later, something was found. A native Panama woman living in the small village of Alto Romero, 12 hours away from the Continental Divide, was out working in a rice paddy by the river when she found Lisanne's blue backpack by the water, completely dry with no damage. She immediately turned the backpack into the authorities and was adamant that the backpack had not been there the previous day. The police found the backpack to be in good condition with no holes or tears. Inside, they found two pairs of sunglasses, two bras, $83 in cash, Lisanne's passport, an empty water bottle, both of their phones, and Lisanne's digital camera, none of which had any water damage. Immediately, the authorities began to look into the phone records and activities, and what they found would be horrifying. The two phones had been used to make numerous emergency calls, but none of them ever went through, and the first one was made only a few hours after the girls began their hike. The police realized that whatever had gone wrong had happened quickly. The first emergency call was placed on Chris's iPhone 4 at 4.39 p.m. on April 1st, and she had dialed 112, which is the emergency number used in the Netherlands. However, Panama uses 911. Just 10 minutes later, Lisanne's phone, a Samsung Galaxy S3, also dialed 112. Neither of these phone calls went through due to no signal being found. For the next two days, April 2nd and 3rd, both phones again tried calling emergency services multiple times. On April 4th, Chris's phone was turned on twice briefly and then shut off. Investigators believe she was powering her phone off in between checking for a signal in order to preserve her phone battery. On April 5th, Lisanne's phone was turned on briefly before finally dying. After April 5th, only activity on Chris's phone was found. Records show that the phone was turned on multiple times, but that her PIN number was entered incorrectly. This told investigators that someone else other than Chris was trying to access her phone. Between April 5th and April 11th, Chris's phone was turned on multiple times each day, but each time an incorrect PIN was entered. The last activity on Chris's phone was at 11.56 p.m. on April 11th. Altogether, the phone had been used to call emergency services for 10 whole days after they first disappeared. Using the phone records, investigators noticed that after the first day, the majority of the phone calls were placed at the same times every day, 10 a.m. and 1 a.m. Authorities were also able to access Lisanne's camera, which was a Canon power shot, which would provide even more evidence. On it were photos showing the girls smiling, posing, taking selfies with the mountains behind them, and seemingly having a great time. There were photos presumably taken around 1 p.m. that showed the two girls at the summit, smiling happily as they should be. But the photos of the girls hiking continued, and hiking experts from the area pointed out that these photos were taken past the Continental Divide, where the Pianista Trail ended and wild terrain began. It appears that the girls kept hiking for some reason instead of reaching the summit and turning around, leading them further and further into the jungle and further away from Boquete. After the happy, smiling photos from the first, no more photos were taken until April 8th, when it was turned back on and more photos were taken. However, these pictures were very different from the previous ones that showed the girls happily hiking. Between the hours of 1 to 4 a.m. on April 8th, 90 photos were taken in the dark using the camera's flash. These photos showed different things. One picture was of the girls' belongings scattered around with toilet paper trailed about and a small mirror, something that was not found in the backpack. Another picture was of a small branch that had some type of red cloth or material, possibly a candy wrapper, attached to it, almost like they were marking their area. Many of the photos were of the treetops, the night sky, rocks, and a steep drop-off looking down. And perhaps the most alarming of the photos was one of a close-up of Chris's head with blood near her temple. A few of these photos have been released to the public and will be on my website, Instagram, and Facebook, but the majority of them have never been made public. 
Along with the photos that were found on Chris's camera, investigators made a startling discovery. One of the photos from the camera had been deleted. The photos from the first day when the girls appeared to be having a good time ended with the stamp 0508. When the camera was used again on April 8th, the next photo was stamped 0510, meaning that photo 0509 was deleted. When it came to this part of the research, I found many differing opinions on what this could mean and how this could have happened. Law enforcement officially stated that with help from experts, they were not able to recover the deleted photo, leading them to believe it was deleted from a computer. This means that someone would have had to take in the camera's SD card, uploaded it onto a computer, and manually deleted the photo. People who believe this theory state that if one of the girls had just deleted the photo straight off the camera, that it would reorder the rest of the photos, not just deleted number 0509. Others say that on this type of camera, it is possible to delete a photo from the camera itself and it won't renumber the other photos. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a concrete answer on this question and Cannon has never made an official statement. After the backpack was found and turned in, law officials went to the area where the photos were taken and conducted a thorough search. One of the night photos showed a monkey bridge in the background, and from comparing the photos to the surrounding area, investigators believed the photos were purposely leading them in the direction of the bridge. A monkey bridge is a rope suspension bridge that locals made to cross the river. It consists of one rope for you to walk on and two ropes to hold onto, and they are very unstable and easy to lose your balance on. The monkey bridge found in the photo is six hours on foot from the Continental Divide where the girls had originally started their hike. However, this search once again turned up nothing. At this point, the Panama government decided to seek help from the Indios, a local tribe in the area, and asked them to take over the search because they knew the region well. Soon after, the Indio tribe found Chris's shorts a few miles away from where the backpack had been found. And there are differing accounts of where and how these shorts were found. Some sources say the shorts were found in the river, and some say they were found folded up on a rock, which could mean two very different things for this case. Two months went by with nothing new in the case when the Indio tribe began finding human remains. The first bone found was a pelvis bone, followed by a rib bone, and soon after, a hiking boot with a foot still in it was found behind a tree. After forensic testing was done, the pelvis was found to belong to Chris, and the foot in the boot was Lisanne's. Soon after, one of Chris's boots was also found in the jungle. As time went on, 33 bones in total were found in and along the river, all belonging to either Chris or Lisanne, and bones were found as high as 2,300 feet above the river. Most of the bones were metatarsals of Lisanne's left foot. However, the bones of each girl were found to be in very different conditions. The bones of Lisanne still had skin attached to them, which was expected for the amount of time they had been missing and the temperature and climate of the region. But Chris's bones were found with no flesh attached to them and appeared to have been bleached by the sun, making them stark white. This is something that happens to bones when they had been in the elements for a very long period of time, but it usually takes much longer than the few months the girls have been missing. Another odd detail is that neither of their bones had marks or indentations on them. Most bones that were out in the elements for that long, being banged around in the river, would have many scratches on them while their bones were completely smooth. Panamanian law officials officially stated that they believe the girls hiked too far and got lost, which is why they began calling emergency services so soon. They believe the girls were alive and looking for help for eight or so days before they died, specifically believing that one of them fell from the monkey bridge and died while the other girl remained alive, before she eventually died due to lack of food and water. They believe that the girls' dead bodies were ravaged by animals and that many of their remains ended up in the river or were washed out by rain. But for many, this theory has some holes in it, and there are too many strange details in the story for it to make complete sense. I'm going to discuss some of the perplexing details of this case that have many believing that something more sinister happened to these two young women. I'm going to go back to the beginning when the girls began their hike. After Chris and Lisanne went missing, law officials searched their room and their shared laptop. 
Computer history showed that prior to the beginning of their hike, the girls researched the Pianista Trail and looked at images of the trail's path. These images clearly show that the trail is meant to be hiked to the summit and then you turn back around. So why would they keep going if they knew they were going off the main trail? Some think that they were simply just being young and wanted to explore. Perhaps they saw something intriguing on these images like a waterfall or cliff and wanted to see it for themselves and plan to hike to that location and then turn back around. Maybe they continued deliberately but didn't pay enough attention to where they were going and weren't able to simply turn back. However, some believe that the girls were with someone else that encouraged them to keep going. Looking at the photos of the girls when they were past the main trail, they didn't look distressed or in danger. They looked as though they were still enjoying their adventure. There is speculation that maybe they were with someone who told them to keep going in order to see something cool, leading them further and further into the jungle, and then they were attacked. Perhaps it was the Dutchmen some locals claimed to have seen the girls having brunch with the day before, or perhaps it was a local person who claimed to know where a cool landmark was, and the girls trusted their expertise. There are also many who believe that they did indeed meet up with that original tour guide they hired, and that he did something to them. The website The Daily Beast did a story on this case, which included talking to locals about this man, who declined to be interviewed for this story. A woman named Nina Von Roan, who rented a property from the tour guide in Boquete, said that, quote, We always saw him with women. He works only with female tourists. He has a preference for German and Dutch, end quote. She described the man as around 65 years old, but very fit and strong for his age. And local tour guide John Tornblom was quoted as saying, quote, Some of our female clients have complained of him harassing them, end quote. And there is also the fact that this man does indeed own a ranch in the jungle, a place he did invite the girls, but they declined his offer. Those who believe that this tour guide had something to do with Chris and Lisanne's death also believe that this man was possibly in deleted photo 0509 and that he deleted it himself. This man admitted to entering the girls' host family's home and their room to see if they were there after they didn't show up for their appointment, leading many to think he could have possibly tampered with evidence or that he plugged the camera into the computer and he deleted photo 0509. He was also the first one to realize the girls were missing and he contacted the host family and encouraged them to contact the police. Some believe that if this man was responsible for their deaths, that he wouldn't have done this and gotten himself involved. However, it is very common for murderers to involve themselves in the search of people they have killed. There is also a lot of speculation about the phone calls the girls made and the cell phone activity in general. As previously stated, after the first few initial calls, the preceding emergency calls followed a pattern. Most of them were placed around 10 in the morning or 1 in the morning. Some think that perhaps the girls had heard searchers looking for them around these times one day or saw a plane fly over at these times and just kept calling at these times thinking it was their best bet. However, others think that the girls were being held by someone against their will and that maybe the person had to leave at that time each day, maybe to go to work or tend to something, and the girls would take their chance at calling for help. But why would someone holding them hostage allow them to keep their phones? Or perhaps they didn't know the girls had phones. There's also the fact that Chris's phone continued to be used, but the pin was entered incorrectly. Was this because Chris was dead and Lisanne was trying to use her phone? Or were both girls dead and someone else was trying to get into the phone? As strange as the activity on their phones were, the activity on the camera is even more puzzling. Investigators are still not sure exactly what the purpose of the 90 flash photos were, although their official statement was that they believed the girls were taking the photos to lead them to where they were stuck, or that Lisanne was taking photos to show them where Chris's body was due to the photo of blood on Chris's head, showing that she was injured. But there are lots of other theories about what these photos could have meant. Some believe that the girls were actually using the flash on the camera to scare off a predator. In the Panamanian jungles, there are jaguars, poisonous snakes, wild boar, and howler monkeys. Many also believe that perhaps the girls could hear searchers in the distance and they were using the flash to alert them to their location. Some even believe that maybe they were using the flash to find their way in the dark. 
After this many days of no food or water, the girls could have been suffering from dehydration, which causes hallucinations and blurred vision, perhaps leading them to using their flash to see better at night. There is even a theory that natives in the area found the camera and accidentally took the photos, not knowing how to use it. Maybe they returned the camera to the backpack because they didn't want to be tied to it and then turned the backpack into the police. This could also explain how the backpack was dry and none of the belongings inside had any water damage. In fact, there were 30 different fingerprints found on the backpack itself, none of which were ever tested. But perhaps the most bizarre detail of the whole case, the deleted photo 0509. There are so many different theories and speculations on what exactly happened here. I've spent a lot of time reading the subreddit Lost Girls of Panama, and it seems like every person has a different opinion on what happened, many of whom claim to be very experienced with computers and cameras. Many believe that if the photo was directly deleted off the camera by one of the girls, either on purpose or accident, it could have been retrieved by law enforcement using a computer. But if the photo was deleted off of a computer, it could not be retrieved, which is what the police said happened. Perhaps someone took the camera home, plugged it into their computer, deleted that photo because it had something incriminating in it, put it back in the backpack, and returned it to the jungle where it would be found. But many ask the question, why wouldn't the person just destroy the camera entirely instead of just deleting one photo? There's also a theory that maybe when the police were uploading the photos to a computer to examine, that someone accidentally deleted photo 0509 and they don't want to tell the public because this looks like negligence. The clothing found that belonged to the girls also raises many questions. Both of their bras were found in the backpack, but why would two women in the jungle decide to take off their bras? Maybe it was too hot and they wanted as little clothing as possible. Also, why were Chris's shorts possibly found folded on a rock? Although many of the locals are adamant that the shorts were found in the river, many of them are also adamant that they were found folded neatly on a rock. What would prompt a woman in the jungle who was in grave danger to fold her shorts up on a rock? And why would she take them off to begin with? And why would she leave them behind? And even if the shorts were found in the river or a local found them and folded them and put them on the rock, they were still found very far from where Chris's remains were discovered, which doesn't make sense. The shorts were the only article of clothing found other than the two bras in the backpack and the two hiking boots. Their tank tops and underwear have never been found. Some people online speculate that perhaps the girls had hypothermia, which causes the body to feel hot, leading people to take off their clothes. However, the Panamanian jungle only gets down to about 50 degrees at night, which is not cold enough for hypothermia. So with all these details, it leaves the question, what exactly happened to Chris and Lisanne? There are so many details to the story. Many of them are different depending on what article you read. I'm going to cover the main theories that I could find, and I want you listeners to decide what theory you think fits this case best. The main theory I found in my research is that the two girls simply got lost while hiking and succumbed to the elements. Many believe that Chris possibly got seriously injured or died, possibly falling from a nearby monkey bridge due to the picture that showed blood on her head and the closeness they were to that bridge. This also lines up with the fact that her phone was being turned on, but the incorrect pin was being entered. Chris could have died while Lisanne remained alive for a few days trying to use Chris's phone because hers had died. Eventually, Lisanne also died, most likely due to lack of food and water. Those who believe this theory think that the photos were taken as a way for the women to show their location. Perhaps they took the photos hoping that their backpack would be found and that the pictures could lead to their location, which did happen, although it was too late. However, many don't believe this theory because of some of the details that just don't add up. When searchers found the spot the photos were taken, their bodies weren't there, and their bodies still haven't been found to this day. It also doesn't explain why the shorts were found neatly folded on the rock or very far away in the river. Many who don't believe this theory also point out an interesting fact. The girls never left behind any kind of message. Most people who know they're in grave danger and on the brink of death would leave a message behind to their family and friends, especially if they had use of technology. The girls had phones that could write notes and take video, as well as a digital camera that could take video. But they left behind nothing. One of the 
photos also showed toilet paper strewn about on top of a rock, something else that they could have used to write a message. Another main theory is that the girls were killed by a wild animal or that they died naturally and then were eaten by animals. People who believe this theory think that the photos were taken at night with the flash because they were trying to scare off a predator with the bright light. This could also explain why their bone fragments were found scattered and why their bodies have never been discovered. However, this does not explain the fact that their bones were very smooth. Forensic scientists have stated that bones that have been scavenged by animals would contain many cuts and indentations, while their bones were found pristinely smooth. There is also a large majority of people who believe that the girl's death was caused by foul play. Perhaps the girls met someone on the trail that had ill intent and they took them further out into the jungle where they could attack them. Their laptop history showed that the girls researched the trail prior to their hike, so why would they intentionally keep going if they knew the trail stopped at the summit? There were also several locals who recalled seeing the girls having brunch with two Dutch men who have never been located. And of course, there is the guy that the girls canceled with who has a history of inappropriate behavior with women. Maybe this man told the police they had an appointment for April 2nd and they didn't show up when in reality they had an appointment for April 1st and he took them deep into the jungle because he knew the region well. Then the next day he could have pretended that they didn't show up, went to their home to act like a concerned citizen and used their laptop to delete the photo with him in it. There's also the fact that this man owns a ranch not far from the Pianista Trail and none of my research said whether or not that property has ever been searched. But many don't buy into this theory because they don't believe a murderer would leave so much evidence behind. There was the backpack full of belongings, the shorts, the camera, and the phone. Most likely, this person would want to destroy anything that could possibly have their fingerprints or DNA on it instead of leaving it out in the open. They would also most likely take the girl's cell phones immediately to ensure they wouldn't call for help, take photos, or write notes in their phone, which they probably would have tried to do if they were being held against their will and able to use their phones. And the last two theories that I could find don't really have much support, but I still wanted to include them. The first one is that native Panamanians killed them. Those who believe this don't really have any evidence to base it off other than the fact that a native woman found the backpack. They think possibly she knew what happened to them and felt guilty about it and wanted to help by turning it into the police. Some think that the girls possibly went into an area of a tribe that didn't want them there and they killed them, although this seems a bit extreme. This theory actually seems somewhat problematic to me because it is assuming that just because these people live in isolated areas away from society that they are dangerous and violent people when there is absolutely no evidence of this. The other theory that doesn't have much evidence is that the girls were killed in connection to organ trafficking. Organ trafficking is when people are killed for their organs, most commonly the liver or kidney, which is then sold to people who need transplants. Although this is a very real thing and it does happen in Panama, law enforcement and investigators see no connection. However, believers of this theory say of course they wouldn't admit a connection because that would hurt Panama's tourist economy and scare people away from visiting the country. So like I said at the beginning of the episode, this case has fascinated me for a long time and I feel like I've done about as much research as possible while still living a normal life. There are so many details, many of which I found contradicting opinions on. Usually when I hear about a true crime case or a disappearance, I immediately have an opinion and it's rare that I change my mind, although it has happened a few times. And this case is no different. I have always thought from the beginning that these poor girls just simply got lost and died due to the elements and lack of food and water. I think they either accidentally kept going on the trail or purposely wanted to go a bit further but didn't know what direction to turn around. I think they just kept going deeper and deeper, eventually getting too far away. I believe that the photos taken at night were to either scare off an animal or to show their surroundings, hoping the police could find their bodies. I think their bodies were most likely dragged away by animals and their bones were washed away with the rain or scattered by those animals. However, there are many details that I still can't wrap my head around, and I think this is why so many people find this case so puzzling. No matter what you 
your stance is, there are things that just can't be explained, such as the backpack not being wet, no message or video being left for their families, the shorts on the rock or in the river so far away, and missing photo 0509. But I have to follow Occam's razor on this, which is the principle of philosophy that states that the case with the least amount of speculation is usually correct. I think that a lot of people don't want to believe that they got lost because it's scary to admit how easy it really is. These two young, intelligent, healthy girls went out on a hike for fun and they lost their lives. Nature is really in control, no matter how much we don't want to admit that. But the one thing I can say with certainty about this case, though, is that the Panamanian law enforcement didn't handle it as well as they could have. They didn't start officially searching for the girls for a few days because they thought they were off partying and didn't take it seriously, which wasted precious time time. They let numerous people touch the evidence without gloves and never tested for fingerprints. They made locals with expertise of the region step down from searching, and they also never utilized aerial thermal surveillance, something that would be able to show the girls' bodies at night through the trees, and something that many point out would be a no-brainer in a case like this. For whatever reason, whether it be lack of knowledge or just straight up negligence, Chris and Lisanne didn't get the investigation they deserved. But as always, I want to know what you guys think. I never want you to go along with what I think just because I'm the one talking and writing this. Do you think this is just a tragic story of two young women getting lost in the jungle? Or do you think something more sinister happened to them? What do you think about missing photo 0509? I want to know what your guys' theories are. You can find the show on Instagram and Facebook at Weird on the Rocks podcast and the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com and Twitter at weird underscore rocks. Please let your friends and family know about the show if you think they would enjoy it. I love hearing from people who had the show recommended to them. That's always so fun. And as always, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate every single one of you. And until next time, cheers and stay weird. That was a Titan Cast episode.